was a symbol of true power. But today, it means nothing but destruction. And all those who used to protect us. Now been overwhelmed. But that, that was yesterday. Before we decided that our playgrounds will now become our battlefields. Agents of the Strategic Homeland Division are highly trained, self-supported tactical agents hidden amongst society. They are trained to restore order and to ensure the continuity of government in case of a catastrophic emergency. But where do they come from? Division agents live a normal life, secretly within many different areas of society. They continue to live ordinary lives until the moment that they are activated. The division shouldn't be compared to an elite military unit in the traditional sense. When military units are trained for specific tasks and missions, the division are a civilian agency whose members lay dormant until Directive 51 is activated. Anyone who's been following me for a little while might remember some of the Lost Agent videos I released. These videos took us through a number of the missing agents and the intel we found in New York City. Some of these included Tanisha Carter, a 33-year-old flight controller from Philadelphia. Joe Chavez, a war zone cameraman. And Michael Trudeau, who was a child prodigy turned professional poker player. Understandably, the most common question I kept getting asked was, how are division agents chosen? A lot seem to have the obvious background in the military or law enforcement, but there are others that seem to have no combat or emergency experience whatsoever. Before we go into how the candidates are chosen, it's probably worth going over the structure of the Strategic Homeland Division to better understand how the recruiters see these candidates as a good fit for the SHD. Officially, according to the US Federal Government, the Strategic Homeland Division is formally listed as part of the Department of Homeland Security. However, they report directly to the President of the United States, and only commence field operations when activated by the National Security Presidential Directive 51. The Strategic Homeland Division is led by a board of directors. There isn't a single centralized facility that everything is run through. Because the SHD has been put in place as a unit that activates in time of catastrophic emergency, having a single headquarters would leave them vulnerable to attack or disaster of some kind. Instead, the rule of three is applied. The Division HQ is located in three identical bunker facilities, called cores. Each core is independently operated and managed by a director with a seat on the board. All three cores are located through the center of the country in South Dakota, Kansas, and Texas. Each core handles routine management and administrative duties during peacetime, but is able to transition instantly after a Directive 51 activation, where they would coordinate intelligence and logistics across the division network. Within the division there are three main departments, research and development, support, and operations. The division's R&D department builds and supports high-level technical solutions for all agency field personnel. They are responsible for the development of SHD technology. The R&D group also maintains the agency's weapons, field equipment, and operations gear. To avoid political intervention, and to keep the organization as covert as possible, the R&D department operate out of a number of dummy companies. The division support group handles routine tasks related to the organization's management, like communications, finance, and human resources. However, in times of activation, the support department also performs key mission-critical functions, such as intelligence analysis and logistical planning. The operations department coordinates the deployment and field work of sleeper agents. Other than top secret covert training exercises, agents do not engage in field work until Directive 51 is invoked. Operations is divided into three branches, internal affairs, strategic, and tactical. The ideal division agent is loyal, able, versatile, and fit. Quick thinking and the ability to make tough decisions when needed and adept problem solving skills are just some of what the agency is looking for when recruiting a new agent. 
A valuable attribute needed for the Division Agent is that they are self-sacrificing and always put others before themselves. For this reason, candidates should have a background in community or enforcement areas like healthcare, military, law enforcement and the rescue services. But working in these fields certainly isn't required. Agents of the Division are required to be able to execute a wide range of tasks. They must be creative, versatile, independent, and capable of operating outside the standard rules of engagement. And because of this, the Strategic Homeland Division seeks agents who come from a number of different areas in society. As long as they're strong in the attributes stated above, having the diversity of skills within each cell of agents only adds to the overall effectiveness of the group. As hidden agents among society, they are often activated with very little knowledge of what's happening behind the scenes. They are free to determine their mission priorities, and are only bound by the oath of service and only regulated by the internal affairs branch of the division's operation group. Once activated and then deployed, a division agent outranks all other tactical units in the field. This authority allows agents to bypass laws, regulations, and jurisdictional boundaries as needed. They can freely organize local assets, whether it be civilian or military, to help address local needs. The division recruiters are granted access to a vast database of restricted information on civilians collected by the United States intelligence community. This access allows them to pick from a huge pool of prospective agents by filtering them through based on the positions and requirements put in place. Candidates are drawn from all aspects of society and are not limited to a specific skill set or profession. Once a candidate has been targeted, a highly classified vetting process begins. Internal Affairs does a background check, including comprehensive financial and medical, work history and extensive surveillance of social media networks. If the candidate makes it through the first line of vetting, an experienced division agent makes contact to organise an interview. If the candidate shows keen interest in national service and understands the need for absolute secrecy, they are then moved on to a rigorous round of assessments. For candidates that make it this far, there is a number of tests they are put through. This phase is called pre-testing. Agency psychologists would run them through an extensive number of performance assessments, including virtual reality mission simulators to see how they would react in different situations. These personal interviews would also put the candidate through a number of cognitive and psychological assessments. The results of this testing produces a comprehensive candidate evaluation report. The report then scores the candidate in each of the following fields. Loyalty, mental resilience, judgment and decision making, field leadership, adaptability, problem solving and the ability to improvise, technical skills and aptitude, commitment to peak physical fitness, immune system health, raw survival instincts. Throughout this testing, the most important piece that is being monitored is the mental strength. These agents are potentially being placed in a situation where they're being pushed to their absolute limits, mentally. Survival and crisis management is a mind game. They need to be able to handle it. Not all candidates have combat experience, and this is fine, but every agent must exhibit the ability to train and prepare for the absolute worst case scenario. Only at this point are candidates considered recruits. Now comes the gruelling process of full physical and technical readiness training. However, due to the secretive nature of this role, it can be difficult to achieve. This process is highly demanding, yet it cannot put recruits in situations where suspicion could compromise their cover. So for this reason, most training is disguised and worked into the recruit's daily life. Examples of this training are exclusive black belt only training classes at neighbourhood martial arts studios, high intensity workouts at local cross training gyms with special instructors who happen to be division trainers, advanced firearms classes or technology courses at local community colleges, again all taught by division experts and attended by other recruits or active agents. The division works closely with every agent to develop effective and credible cover stories for these activities. New division agents are slowly brought into the process of the day-to-day -day division agent life. This is to further protect the secrets of the Strategic Homeland Division. During the first six months of training, each agent is re-evaluated weekly for progress, including mental strength and psychological stability. It could take up to 12 months of intense training before a new agent has opened up to the division's true purpose. Eventually recruits earn top security clearance and are certified by internal affairs as active agents. But it doesn't stop here. Agents are expected to maintain year-round training for the length of their service. Basic survival skills, combat and intelligence training is required to be honed through regular practice and exercise. The general consensus is that agents devote their spare time to training and preparation. The support department contracts civilian instructors to provide specialist training and advanced group exercises on a regular basis. On top of this, each local sale of agents are expected to coordinate and perform regular exercises and training sessions.
Once the initial training is complete, new division agents continue with their daily lives and function as normal members of society. Agents live where they will operate once activated, allowing for quick response times and removing the need for redeployment. The status of division agents is considered a state secret and is classified at the highest level. Identities and tracking protocols are only known to the most senior members in the Pentagon. Even high-ranking government officials aren't privy to this information. Division agents are drawn straight from society, trained up, and then put right back where they left off. Agents from all across the country and come from a variety of different workplaces in society. They could be police officers, paramedics, construction workers. They could even be the guy selling hot dogs on the corner of the street. Because of the requirement of absolute secrecy around the division's existence, it can be quite a challenge for agents who are rejoining society. This is only made harder with the constant ongoing training and personal development. So there you have it. Agents can be selected for anywhere, provided they meet the criteria that the recruiters are looking for. However, it's what comes next that defines whether they're suitable for the Strategic Homeland Division. A long period of rigorous testing and psychological assessments when placed under the most stressful of situation is what truly defines whether a candidate will be a part of the secret agency. But even after successfully passing this phase, the next ongoing challenge begins. Friends, loved ones, no one can know of the existence of the SHD and their place as an agent within it. With the requirement of ongoing training and development, the agent is expected to essentially run a second life in secrecy. So what do you think? If you were approached, would you go through with it? Thanks for watching guys, I really appreciate your viewership. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll catch you in the next one.